to get into the webinar itself. So the Emerging Leaders series is the 2022 instalment of JCU Singapore's public lecture in research series. This year, our series showcases emerging research leaders at JCU Singapore, together with their capacity for community or industry outreach, by pairing each of our emerging leaders with one or more ind industry partners. So our panel today reflects this ethos. And I'm very pleased to introduce you to our speakers and I'll introduce them in the order in which they'll be speaking today. So Rachel Kelly is a multi-award winning journalist with over 15 years of experience under her belt. Rachel has covered various significant events across the globe, having her career span across Asia, the Middle East, Europe and the US. She started off her career in broadcast journalism in 2007 and was one of the first journalists to report for multiple platforms encompassing TV, radio and print nationwide. Well versed in business current affairs, she was recognised for her skills in financial reporting and was recently awarded Investor Education Journalist of the Year 2021 and a special award for financial journalism in 2012 for the Securities Investors Association Singapore Investors Choice Awards. Rachel was also recognised for her work in covering environmental issues by the Singapore Environment Council. Rachel takes pride in having worked with prominent figures globally. The most memorable interviews she has conducted are those with Jane Goodall, Jack Ma and Christine Lagarde. Welcome, Rachel. Our second speaker today is Dr. Zora Mohammadi, and this is a showcasing of Zora as one of our JCU Singapore Emerging Leaders. She's a senior research fellow in tourism at James Cook University, Singapore. Zora received her PhD in tourism in 2019 with her qualitative study on childhood travel experiences and motivations. Her research focus is on tourism behavior and experience, tourism marketing and events, activities and amenities for children and introducing new emerging markets. Her research interests are particularly concentrated on the intersection of two of JCU's teaching and research themes, industries and economies in the tropics and peoples and societies in the tropics. We look forward to hearing from Zoré as one of our emerging leaders today. And third, but very much not least, we are welcoming today Geraldine Donatand, who writes for trade media, specializing in business events, MICE, and travel and tourism. She also consults and tra uh, conducts training in marketing PR. At JCU Singapore, she teaches MICE in the master's program and previously taught disaster resilience in the master's in planning and urban design. Her previous corporate experience was in Singapore Airlines, Trade Winds Tours and Travel, and TTG Asia Media. Volunteer activities include guiding in museums and heritage trails. Geraldine is a member of the Singapore Press Club and Institute of Public Relations of Singapore, and she sits in the Heritage Committee of the Eurasian Association. So as you can see, we are well grounded here with our emerging leader and some wonderful industry partners to hear from. And I understand that we had some interest from Singapore Press Club in attending today. So I hope you'll put in lots of Q&A uh, that we can address at the end of the session. So today's session, is fact or fake media impact on tourism futures. Since 2020, COVID-19 coronavirus disease has impacted tourism as a contagious global pandemic. The tourists' perception of safety and risk has a significant impact on post-pandemic travel behavior and perception of the destination. This session explores the role of media in times of pandemics on both the supply and demand sides of tourism from the perspectives of academic and industry experts and will serve as a forum for discussing research opportunities and resolving some of the issues. So no small challenge for our presenters today and I welcome Rachel as our first speaker. Please share your screen with us. Thank you, Denise, sharing my screen now. Can you see my slides? Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Um, just to add to that, I think I don't need to show this slide, but just to add that I'm also the former public relations director 
of a hotel here in Singapore as well. So when we're talking about media impact on tourism, I've dipped my toe into both sectors as well. So I hope to shed some light on that. But just to go back to what I'll be covering today as part of the presentation, uh, while we are going to be discussing a fact or fake media tourism on media impact on tourism futures. I hope to share with you all my experience covering COVID from the booth. I am a radio presenter. It's my day job. I also volunteer for the Singapore Press Club as part of the management committee. But I'd like to share with you what it's been like as a broadcast presenter covering COVID-19 and breaking news on COVID from across the globe. So first of all, the question is, what is the purpose of journalism? Um, as a media professional, this I, I found this quote from the American Press Institute, and I thought it was quite apt for today's session. It says, news is that part of communication that keeps us informed of the changing events, issues, and characters in the world outside. Though it may be interesting or even entertaining, the foremost value of news is as a utility to empower the informed. And we talk about empowering, we talk about empowering with facts. Okay. So let's first take a look at COVID and media consumption. Over the last two years, or it's two and a half years now since COVID-19 first hit, we've seen a shift in media consumption, and this has been illustrated by a number of studies, and that is that consumers are looking for fact. We've, we've spoken about the fake news pandemic, um, and we see the shift here in Singapore. If I can just um, alert you to this particular study by Nanyang Technological University, their Center for Inf Information Integrity, they found that prior to the pandemic, Facebook was used by between 32 and 30 37% of those polled to read the news. WhatsApp, between 26 and 30%. And uh, this is lower than, sorry, this is after the pandemic. This is lower than the 38 to 46% of newspaper sites. So we see that newspapers as well as broadcast publications are up, uh, higher in comparison to social media and um, other online outlets that are not official news sites. But before the pandemic, this was uh, somewhat the reverse. They found that WhatsApp actually accounted, 52% of people actually went to WhatsApp for news consumption. So why is this uh, an issue? Well, if you're receiving news via WhatsApp or social media, how do you know whether it's fact or fiction? As a journalist, one of the concerns that I have is uh, with social media quite often, uh, news consumers may only read the headline without going into the article to find out more. And that can be the case with a tweet or a social media post. So how confident are people that they can establish a difference between fact and fiction? Well, they're pretty confident, but can they actually do it? So about 48 to 53% of people said that they could tell if a piece of information on social media is true or false. However, about seven in 10 admitted that they have unknowingly shared fake news. So this is quite an interesting article. It was up on the Straits Times just a few months ago. It's called Many in Singapore Confident that They Can Spot Fake News, but may not actually be able to do so. So how do you spot a fake? So this image on the right, this is news just out this week, and it's related to the situation between Russia and Ukraine. And this, is be, this went viral on social media, on Japanese social media, actually. And as you can tell, you can see the DW logo in the corner there. DW wasn't the only news organization to be targeted by fake news. BBC, CNN were also hit as well. And we saw a number of fake headlines being circulated online, um, sharing disinformation about the war between Russia and Ukraine. So if you see this at face value, it looks like an actual news article, doesn't it? You can't, you can't tell, that could have been a screenshot from DW's website. It's fake news. So what does this mean for travel? It's not just news sites. We've also seen in the media lately that a number of consumers when it comes to travel have been fit, 
have been hit by fake websites and perhaps fake news when it comes to offers. We're all itching to get out and about and travel again after two and a half years of pandemic. I haven't actually left Singapore since the end of 2018. So I know everyone's looking for a good travel deal, but could this be too good to be true? Um, so it's not just news websites, it's also making sure that you're not falling prey or victim to false travel websites as well. So these two sites are actually fictitious. And as we can see from this report in the Straits Times, at least $34,000 was lost to Singaporeans. This happened earlier this month. Um, and this is to scams involving fake travel agent websites. So it's also important to check with, re with the credible news sources such as the Straits Times to find out you know, what the latest could be when it comes to such scams, when it comes to travel trends, because it could save you falling victim to the same scam. So how do you spot a fake? You will want to take a look at the web link. If you do see a, a, a photo circulating on social media and the headline doesn't quite look right, maybe go back to the original news source, go and have a look on the BBC website, the Straits Times website, or even DW's website, as we saw with the case earlier type in a search on the headline to see if it's actually uh, a, a credible piece of news, if, if the story is true or false. Have a look and see who else is reporting the story. If it is a major headline, the chances are more than one news agency will be covering it. Also, don't take images at face value, as we saw if they're circulating on social media. We all know it's very easy to manipulate images now. Uh, stick to credible sources of news for your news and media consumption and updates. Um, and as I said, if it sounds right, does it sound right or does it sound sensational? The fact is, if it sounds sensational, it's possibly fake news. So now that the borders have started opening up and we're able to travel again, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the role of media because as a broadcast journalist over the last two years, it's been challenging keeping up with all the different COVID regulations across the globe and all the different updates. Um, you know, even as a consumer, you could be in the air on the way to a country and perhaps COVID measures could change. I think that happened to quite a number of people last year. So what we've seen happen here in Singapore is we've seen the media take on a role of helping to um, provide consumers with the information that they need when it comes to traveling and flying. So these are just two examples. The Straits Times launched two tools earlier this year. One is called First Flight Out, and that's a series of travel guides and ST videos, foreign correspondence. They talk about new experiences. So if you want to go overseas, they recommend the experience. But this particular one, the second one, I thought was a really interesting tool. And that's if you if you click on the link, um, it's helps it helps you with pandemic travel planning. You type in your destination, it will tell you what the rules and regulations are when it comes to COVID-19 in that particular country. So you know perhaps what um, forms you need to fill out, what are some of the restrictions when you land, do you need to wear a mask, do you need to have some kind of pass when you arrive to make sure that you are prepared to travel um, and just to educate you in terms of what you might need when you're looking to, to travel overseas. Okay, so here's my experience from the booth. I think from a journalist perspective, it's important to uh, ensure that the information we're giving to, the, to our listeners is factual. Uh, fact checking is constant. Uh, which, you know, in a breaking news environment can be very hairy. I've just come off shift now. My show ended about 45 minutes ago and we have breaking news nonstop around the hour for the three hours of the show. Um, keeping it short, keeping the information um, succinct so that listeners get what they need without overwhelming them with information is also very important. Credible sources, Fact checking, as I mentioned, going on to government websites to ensure that the information is correct. We're very fortunate here at the station that I work for that we are partnered or we do have our sister paper. So we have the Straits Times and the Business Times, and they have a team of editors that uh, go through and fact check any articles that go onto their website. So often we'll go there as well. 
We also bring onto the station experts for interviews to provide more information to our listeners if there's a particular issue taking place in a country when it comes to COVID-19 to help our listeners understand what the actual situation is. And then again, when I say expert interviews, we're talking about credible experts um, that we bring onto the show that are able to share with our listeners what the situation might be, what they need to be aware of. Um, for example, here in Singapore, we saw COVID-19 cases hit 16,000 yesterday. That's up from 5,000 the day before. We'll have somebody coming on the show to talk about, well, I think later tonight to talk about what that means here in Singapore, the COVID-19 situation and what we should all be aware of uh, when we're going out and about and uh, being cautious here in Singapore as well. So that is uh, what I would like to share with you today. If you have any questions, I look forward to just discussing them further in the Q and A. Thank you, Rachel, much appreciated. That sounds fascinating already. I've got some questions lined up. <laughs> uh, and so we now will welcome Zora, our second speaker. We'll be talking about her research in tourism. Zora, you're muted. That happens Sorry. so often, doesn't it, in our Zoom world? <laughs> Please go again. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dennis, for your uh, kind introduction. And thank you, Rachel, for your inspiring presentation. OK, uh, since 2020, uh, we all are aware COVID-19 has impacted tourism as contagious global pandemic. Uh, the tourist perception of safety and risk has a significant impact on uh, post-pandemic travel behavior and perception of uh, the destination. Uh, this session will explore the role of media in uh, times of pandemic on both uh, the supply and demand side of tourism. And uh, today I want to uh, focus on pandemic background, uh, how crisis was managed uh, during this time, also talking about the role of media and uh, how uh, media form destination image and could impact uh, travel perception and uh, intention. According to COVID-19 dashboard of uh, World Health Organization as reported in April 2020, the pandemic has caused more than half a billion confirmed cases and nearly 6 million deaths. This pandemic caused global economic inequality and inflation, and tourism industry has been particularly infected by closure of borders and restrictions, and uh, we could see restrictions on mobility. Uh, by 2020, uh, the pandemic has reduced international tourist arrivals by more than 1.1 billion. Uh, International travel was severely impacted by the pandemic in uh, 2020, which started and continued uh, early 2021. Uh, that's why uh, we decided in 2021 with my colleagues at JCU Singapore to do a series of studies on uh, the role of media and studying COVID-19 and evaluate the effect of pandemic on both uh, demand and supply sides of tourism. Uh, crisis negative effects on tourism are well known. Destinations may suffer from disasters and crises if arrivals and uh, spending are significantly decreased. For example, studies uh, show that after an Ebola outbreak in Africa or a SARS outbreak in China, uh, tourism numbers significantly decreased, uh, similar to how uh, public anxiety during COVID-19 pandemic along with travel's reputation as a dangerous and frequently challenging activity has led to a marked decline in travel uh, demand. Uh, despite the precautions that government around the world took to fight the virus, uh, successful crisis management uh, can be crucial to the success of recovery efforts in order to improve a destination's reputation during post-crisis recovery, government's policies, uh, effective public uh, effective positive communication and new tourism products may be uh, useful. Uh, how the media portrays a country's responses to COVID-19 pandemic can affect how different people view a place. For example, how timely 
and early virus was diagnosed and treated or how forceful and rapid the pandemic was uh, responded. Uh, therefore, um, effective crisis management can present a chance for repairing the image of the destination. And because of the nature of crisis management, particularly during an uh, epidemic or pandemic, it's, impos uh, it's possible to use sentiment expressed in newspapers to reflect the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of the destination's mitigation measures. And one of the crucial issues in the field of crisis management is the management of crisis communication. Uh, the necessity of a crisis communication strategy is highlighted by the significant role of media playing in disseminating uh, information during a crisis. Uh, talking about the role of media, we know uh, that information is essential during a crisis and uh, media is uh, in its all forms, including social media, uh, destination websites and mass media are the primary sources of of information throughout crisis. Uh, additionally, news media and other media platforms shape destination's image during a crisis. Um, there is limited attention given to the role of media exposure, and uh, we can see previous studies are more based on uh, the role of social media, not all forms of it, which we try to focus uh, on all forms of uh, media and evaluate the role. Uh, we were interested to know to what extent travelers uh, were using different sources to get information uh, during this pandemic. Comparing all forms of media, we discovered that social media was the primary source of information for travelers, uh, followed by mass media and tourism, tourism and hospitality websites. Uh, are currently less popular, but still we can see more than 50% of travelers uh, use them as a source of information. During COVID-19, travelers uh, use Facebook and YouTube more than any other forms of communication to gather information. And uh, TV uh, was by far most popular source followed by newspapers. And um, uh, based on tourism and hospitality websites, the government websites and tourism adv advisory websites uh, were uh, more popular. Uh, also, media uh, exposure was examined to determine the extent to which travelers are exposed to pandemic without actively seeking it. And findings reveal that travelers found uh, the exposure from various sources uh, to be nearly similar between uh, different sources, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, also travelers evaluated information coverage almost same within these three uh, Forms. Uh, media coverage can either positively or negatively uh, shape a tourist destination image, and this can happen organically or artificially. Uh, furthermore, during a crisis, media coverage can have a significant impact on the perception and image of tourists, and such influences have been studied in the literature and the effect on long-term travel desire has been observed. But we were curious how such portrayal could influence in short run. Um, information um, disseminated through mass media and social media has a significant impact on public opinion and perception of destination safety. During a crisis, mass media and social media may have an even greater impact on people's perception and intentions. Um, even in the post-COVID-19 environment that we experience and still we are experiencing, media updates and coverage has the potential uh, to influence travel behaviors. Travelers are increasingly seeking information from media and it is especially important for non-visitors who typically have little knowledge of the destination and must rely on media media or internet to gain information. Uh, focusing on destination image and how media uh, could uh, affect it, uh, the result of our study uh, uh, showed, uh, which is focused on Singapore and New Zealand, uh, showed that how destinations are portrayed uh, 
depends on the elimination or mitigation of course being made as well as the severity of COVID-19 pandemic uh, during the time of the study. Uh, and uh, we were focused on what was reported in the newspapers. Uh, in this study, uh, sentiment analysis was used to track trends in New Zealand and Singapore. Uh, and uh, we wanted to uh, find out how newspaper uh, covers uh, over time uh, based on these two destinations. Uh, the government received the majority of media attention in both destinations. The reactions of destination governments to the crisis demonstrates that media's influence on sentiment, which is portrayed. Um, and an analysis of uh, the sentiment change over three months period uh, was uh, performed to identify media portrayal of government measures at a destination. Uh, Singapore, uh, Singaporean newspapers were um, more uh, critical uh, and uh, we could see more positive comments were made about New Zealand COVID-19 responses, especially the emphasis on health risk was observed. Uh, both destinations uh, mean sentiment uh, fell over time, but New Zealand maintained a higher mean sentiment by, um, and we could see by the end of this period, the risk factor for New Zealand as a destination and other travel focus factors had received more positive sentiment in newspapers. Uh, in addition, the trend uh, of change uh, in sentiment uh, towards Singapore and New Zealand is compared uh, uh, to the number of new cases in each country during the first quarter of 2020. And uh, this graph demonstrates a, a symptomatic correlation between the number of infection in both countries and how this, the nation's crisis management is portrayed in the media. Uh, about the same number of COVID cases were initially reported in both destinations um, in February 2020. Uh, and we can see by March 2020, uh, three months later, there had been more improvement in how both nations uh, were portrayed in newspaper from China, uh, the US and Australia. Newspapers uh, praised uh, New Zealand uh, for quick action uh, based on the actual elimination of force that led to successful uh, containment of COVID-19 uh, virus uh, incidents. Similar to these, Singapore initially hesitated about the kind of measures to implement and adopted a cautious and wait-to-see attitude, which caused negative sentiments expressed in newspapers uh, published in the major uh, market, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, focusing on the uh, destination image and how it can be shaped and uh, framed based on uh, crisis management strategies. Uh, the results show that the translation of successful or unsuccessful crisis management by destination can be framed positively uh, or negatively by newspapers in uh, tourist generating countries. When a destination's crisis management strategy fails, negative sentiment emerge. And when a strategy succeeds, sentiment and portrayal about the destination tend to shift in the positive direction. Uh, regardless of a destination, um, a good reputation, newspapers reports can quickly shift parallel to the direction of crisis management outcomes. Uh, the theory of media framing addresses tourist risk perception, is based on media portrayal of a destination and its crisis management strategies, and also the threat level uh, at that time. Uh, so we can say prospective tourists rely on uh, the variety of news sources to form an opinion about a destination. Um, and if we want to talk about the strategies uh, that uh, can be used during this time of going through the literature, we can see different strategies. Uh, one of them uh, is a source focused strategy, which includes uh, media relationships, uh, media blockage, and others. The second strategy can be 
uh, message focused strategies, including ignorance of uh, crisis and uh, um, uh, reducing the scale of crisis. And the third one can be destination focused strategies. Um, there are some attempts to correct or listen negative publicity, uh, make us aware of audience, news sources, uh, messaging, messaging approaches. And uh, we may need to take into account a fourth option based on the literature, which is postponing efforts to promote destination image until the crisis has been resolved. We can better understand media framing and public relation uh, strategies by keeping an eye on messaging that are being published in newspaper uh, during uh, the crisis time. Uh, here is assumed that when framing in media is significantly more negative, the result of those sentiments expressed will be poor reputation for the location. One way to comprehend the narrative portrayed by media is to be aware of connection between media framing and intensity of positive and negative sentiment expressed by media. Um, and uh, continuing our journey and how media uh, impacts image and now uh, the image is shaped by media, how uh, this one can impact uh, the perception. We can talk about uh, trust. Uh, trust can be defined as one party's belief in uh, dependability and integrity of an exchange uh, partner. Uh, it is an effective tool for reducing uncertainty and trust perception has been identified as one of key factors influencing travelers' intentions. Um, and the relationship between people's trust and their behavior intent uh, has been studied uh, in many contexts, uh, and we, which we try to uh, use it for our study and studying uh, the effects of uh, COVID. The perception of trust has been identified as an important factor in the likelihood in the likelihood of visitation and public trust in government um, pandemic management measures was critical to the acceptance and implementation during COVID-19, which was portrayed by media. Oh, sorry. Just bear with me for a second. Uh, individuals' destination choices and travel be behavior can uh, be significantly influenced by tourist perceived risk and travel fear and negative information about uh, the um, pandemic in social media and media, broadcast, uh, media broadcasting others' reactions, fear, uh, panic to our pandemics can shape such perception. Also misleading information and uh, uh, imagery can have a particular negative impact on those who have never visited a destination before. This is especially important because tourists who are unfamiliar with a destination are more likely to rely uh, on uh, external information sources. Um, tourist perception of destination safety is a multidimensional construct which is composed of a, a functional, financial, health, political, uh, and uh, social factors. And people with motivation to travel may seek information that is relevant to their needs. Uh, travelers uh, within our studies found the information to be mostly informative, uh, although shocking as well. And some travelers found the media portrayal of COVID-19 period be encouraging while others found it uh, discouraging, though the former was more uh, prevalent. And finally, uh, talking about their behavior and how behavior was uh, in, uh, impacted by COVID, uh, respondents preferred to travel to destinations that successfully managed pandemic crisis, implemented hygiene and safety protocol, and have effective healthcare system. Uh, these support earlier researches, which shows that destination image can uh, affect future travel behavior on a cognitive as well as effective level. 
uh, the findings of confirmed perceived higher risk leads to um, cautious uh, travel behavior and a shift in confidence and sentiment from uh, cautious to conscious travel behavior can happen. Um, I also uh, want uh, to thank Prof. Abhishek Bahati, Prof. Tiro Marin, Dr. Zinmiya Kemal, uh, Dr. Simona Azali, Dr. Zahra Kurabadin, Ms. Manisha Agarwal, Ms. Jardin Tan, and Ms. Karen Sim uh, for their effort in completing the series of uh, studies uh, at JCU Singapore. Thank you. Thank you, Zora. That was a fantastic presentation, and I think we'll all be inspired to try something new in our presentations. <laughs> Very innovative. And now Thank we you. will welcome Geraldine as our final speaker. Thanks, Geraldine. You're welcome to share your slide. Zora, you can mute yourself now. Shall I start now? Yes, please. Right, so I'm actually going to pick up on some of the points that uh, were presented by our first two speakers. And I must um, say at the start that I will be presenting in a way that is, um, well, wearing two hats because I am both a, a journalist and editor. So that is the media role but I'm also an adjunct lecturer and I have taught public relations at both the Curtin and JCU previously. I've taught market, integrated marketing communications and uh, as was mentioned, I've also taught mice. So I will be um, focusing on various aspects in my presentation. Geraldine, just reminding you, you're not sharing yet. Oh, sorry. We can see you though, that's fine. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I had done my screen share. Not yet. Okay, I'm on screen share now. Yes, but we need to see your presentation mode. We can see your menu. That's it, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, sorry, uh, fumbled a bit there. Uh, as you can see, I'm a print person, not a video. <laughs> and I belong to the last century. <laughs> okay, so anyway, as I was saying, I'm going to pick up on some of the things mentioned by the two previous speakers. And what I will do is um, highlight certain aspects that uh, haven't been mentioned uh, before. And I hope to provoke you or perhaps just stimulate some thought. Hopefully we uh, don't end up in big arguments though. Uh, and I hope uh, to use a Singapore terminology that my fellow media uh, professionals don't say I sabo media. Okay, so as a prelude, I will just uh, mention very briefly that uh, the Edelman Trust Barometer is something that's produced every year in January. It receives a lot of consumer media attention, but not so much in the trade. But what is the interesting thing is that in January 2020, Edelman's uh, wonderful global report, which is normally 27 or 28 countries, became very out of date within just a month or two. So in May of that year, they read it, but instead of all the countries, they just focus on 11, uh, which is represented on the right. And the interesting thing to note is at that time, what came out tops in terms of trust was actually government. So government sources of news were the most trusted and uh, at 65%, and uh, the media came in a bit lower, at 56%, especially in, among the media, traditional media did a lot better than social media. In fact, 67% of people uh, uh, surveyed even said they feared fake news. That, that was back then, okay? Then if you look at this bigger slide here uh, in the middle, this is the latest January 2022 uh, survey, which now shows that uh, the global 27, 
what has happened is business is now the most trusted source of news, including employers, by the way. Okay, government uh, compared with last year, Jan 21, has lost 1% and the media have lost 1%. But if you compare with previously, where they fared better in May of 2020, that's quite a drop. Okay, especially for government from 65 down to 52%. So what does that suggest? The takeaway I have wrote, I've put it down here, when you're providing information on how countries are handling the pandemic, what we notice is that the media can and do influence people's perceptions and opinions. Okay, so if we look at media trust in particular, the news sources have a problem. This is a longitudinal study. Over a 10-year period, nobody has come out in the blue zone, which is trust. Neutral would be the search engines and traditional media. And what have had fared badly are the owned media and social media. I need to clarify, when we talk about owned media, we are referring to um, communication channels that an organization has control over, their own mouthpiece as such. Okay? So uh, coming from traditional media, I'm somewhat comforted by this, but it's still a decline over the years. And what you can find, uh, see here is that uh, social media have done poorly. In terms of fake news, which was uh, in Rachel's presentation, this is concerning. And uh, it would seem that a lot of people are very uh, attuned to the dangers of uh, falling prey to fake news. Because if you look at this, the Global 27 in uh, the 2022 Edelman Trust Barometer, it's 76%, not trust, okay? Oof fear fake news being used even as a weapon. And among the countries, more than half are at all time highs. They don't trust anyone. So can you, people in the audience, tell fact from fiction or fake? I hope after listening to Rachel, uh, you are a bit clearer on, on this score at least. Okay. I also want to pick up on some terms uh, Rachel used about misinformation or, and disinformation. So what is the difference and is there a difference? With misinformation, it is one that may not be intentional. You may just get the wrong end of the stick, so to speak, okay? So it may be that you have prevented, uh, presented something out of context or uh, used the statistics wrongly, but it may not have been on purpose. However, with disinformation, it is definitely deliberate. Put all my D's there, all right? So you purposely put out false data. And it could be to either just mislead or deceive and trick people. And both forms are uh, things we should know because they are widely spread, especially with the speed of uh, the internet, okay? So how do you spot? It's very important to be on the lookout, okay? To spot the misinformation and the disinformation. Because the disinformation, by the way, is sometimes used by what are called uh, national organizations, uh, bad actors and others. It is not just about swindling, okay? It is putting out falsehoods and creating uh, different picture altogether, spinning a different story. Okay. I've given the source of you, and more interested, please uh, look at Business Insider. There's a good article on it. And even the WHO uh, pointed out to something, at the height of the pandemic, they said there was something called an infodemic. And what does that mean? It was information overload. Everywhere was just flooded whether it was digital or um, conventional media, there were so many facts uh, that people were spewing out, but were they true or were they rumors? Were they fears? Everything went viral, spreading globally. Okay? So it wasn't only the coronavirus. Now, coming back to the role of the media, which we talked about, why is media publicity important? 
in the good old days, uh, those of us who um, you know are from the traditional mainstream media, we have always prided ourselves on something called editorial integrity. So the publicity that you get when you read your newspaper or watch the news on TV or listen to it on the radio and other things, you would expect that it is credible that they have done their fact-checking and everything. Because the media are seen to be the third party, that they don't have a vested interest, that they are objective. Okay, so that's why it is called earned media. So when we talk about the media, usually we are referring to earned media, even if we don't call it such. Okay? And it's believed, uh, as uh, public relations uh, professionals would say, uh, it is much better than paid media, which is basically advertising. Because if you're an advertiser, you are not going to say bad things about yourself, right? You will embellish it as much as possible to your advantage. So um, the problem, however, is that those of us who still subscribe to this, uh, the principles of editorial integrity and all that uh, are also finding that we are um, a dwindling bunch, okay? Because there are many print publications, broadcast stations who have either died or are just struggling to survive because you really need the revenue. So there are two sides of the coin. Meanwhile, the new media are doing very well. And there are bloggers and influencers, and, and this is where I can get into trouble with some of them, what I call the key opinion leaders. We know that many of them are being paid for stories and product reviews that are put out there, which others would think is editorial, but they are not. They are paid. Now, when we talk about the um, editorial publicity, sponsored content should be labeled as such. So if you go to a lot of the, the websites of the um, various media and print magazines, you will notice very clearly what is editorial, but it could also carry something with a, a label, say, sponsored content. Or promotional content or in partnership with and i'm one who says this should be very clearly identified so people know okay am i reading editorial or is this an advertorial uh, however sadly recent research has shown has shown that many people don't really consider the earned media any more credible or efficacious than traditional advertising so that's sad. Okay, so another thing about the uh, media coverage uh, to pick up on what Zori was saying during the pandemic, I've taken one from an academic source, a journal. Um, this was actually, this, this first quote was something that was put online um, back in November, 2020, the first year of the pandemic, but has only recently had, uh, has only been recently published um, in the CIT, current issues in tourism, okay? And, and that's why it says 2022, it takes it from there. But uh, these researchers uh, found a direct correlation between what was reported in the media and people's um, decisions then on travel. The full title, um, if I may just read out, <coughs> is the impact of COVID-19 media coverage on tourists' awareness for future traveling. It is a very um, interesting and useful article to read. Um, those of you who are interested, I can give you, as, uh, for the people or the academics, I can give you the DOI uh, link later in the Q&A if you are interested, okay? Um, what I want to mention here is the upshot of what they were trying to say is that um, there were two significant elements that came out from their study, which is the quality of media sources. So we should pay attention to that. And the level of the target market's perceived physical risk. Okay, So these are things we should look at uh, before developing the content of our media messages. Now here's a second one. This is a quote that uh, was an echo for the Singapore media. 
where the Minister for Communications and Information in her speech at the Singapore Press Club 50th anniversary dinner complimented our local media for their accurate reporting, presenting the situation without um, trying to gloss over, without exaggeration. So it was presented in such a way that uh, the people would understand exactly where we were at the different stages of the pandemic. All right, so having uh, covered that first part, has the title, <clears throat> where is travel and tourism heading? Okay, Zori mentioned that we have gone from the cautious to the conscious and the courageous behavior from 2020 into 2021, and now we are in 2022. So definitely there is a pent up demand for travel. Okay, everybody wants to go up there and, and travel again. And that's what all the surveys are telling us. So it's a question of, to use a bit of marketing speak, the push and pull factors. So push is um, on, on our part uh, where we are feeling this uh, restlessness that we must go and travel. So that's pushing us to go. And what are destinations uh, doing and suppliers? It's the pull. They are trying to entice us to come visit again. In the course of the pandemic in 2020, what uh, was interesting is that obviously with borders were closed and uh, people couldn't travel, there was no point doing product advertising. So companies like uh, brands like Marriott, instead of showing your typical hotel or resort, what they did was image corporate advertising, telling people to stay safe, stay healthy, and we're waiting for your return, okay? So nothing to show about hotels. On the other hand, if you look at a destination, this is Chile, where surveys were saying people wanted the great outdoors, they were taking driving holidays and hiking, as this picture here shows, you know, uh, where it was uh, fresh air, no crowds, okay? So destinations with these sort of um, opportunities were planting all this subtly in their target audience mind. Okay, um, now to share a little bit of the trends. If we look at the travel trends in 2022, this is a study that TripAdvisor did together with uh, Ipsos, okay? And what they had, um, I won't read all of them out, but the survey was interesting because it uh, basically found that on the one hand, there's a strong rebound, uh, which is good news for us in the hospitality industry. But the second thing is that a lot of people were still a bit wary. They would travel domestically and not internationally, which for Singapore is not good news, okay? because um, we can't go very far domestic, although our domestic tourism actually did pick up thanks to government handouts, something called the Singapore Rediscovers vouchers. Okay, uh, for the third thing is that when people are traveling, they are not wanting to do the same whole thing. They are looking for new and specific experiences. So the important thing is the experience, not just sightseeing. Fourth is uh, something a bit unusual and uh, something we're not accustomed to in this part of the world. People actually say they're willing to pay subscription uh, services for travel. Okay. And the fifth thing is uh, obviously a follow through from all the, the pandemic concerns where people would still want to know what are the case numbers. So 16,000 doesn't look good, but we're still getting people coming in. All right, which uh, kind of deep. Uh, contradicts what we are reading here. So they want to know how, how many cases, but they also want to know safety protocols, etc. Which is why um, the sixth thing is that because of, of uh, the sentiment, those who are in the industry will have to make sure that their health uh, measures and everything are still in place. So probably we still be wearing masks for some time. The other thing I just want to mention to, um, to you would be to uh, have a look. We don't have time to go through all this. I can discuss in the q and if you'd like, 
the, the, there were only five countries surveyed in this, basically what we call the Western world, uh, the UK, US, and Australia. And then in Asia, it was Japan and Singapore. Now, I have circled some of the interesting things because these findings kind of contradict what previous surveys were saying. Like I said, you know, people want the, the great outdoors and all these sort of things, but it's not showing up very much because if you look at the Brits, they're not interested in road trips. And if you look at the Americans, what's happening? Because they, you know, they have wonderful national parks and the RV parks and all that, but not great demand. Okay, uh, and um, Japan is a, an interesting one. They're not into all these various things. Uh, Singapore and Japan actually tend to have a lot in common here, where for travel, they like cultural uh, activity, uh, cultural and sightseeing, uh, and not into things like camping, even or even if it is glamping. And Singapore still, Singaporeans still live up to this image that we go for shopping, but we also love cruises. I think if you read, uh, if you just read the newspaper, the cruise is picking up again. And, and the cruise, by the way, was allowed to operate and it was all cruise to nowhere out of Singapore to keep the industry going okay, uh, during the pandemic. And we're now beginning to look at things like wellness, spas, etc. And we still believe in good tours. So, from all that, does one swallow make a sum up? Very quick comparison. I can elaborate on this later uh, if you'd like. Um, in terms of the different kind of headlines and stories that you read. Okay, so I'm going to show this all at one go. Uh, cheaper FS will disappear as more Americans plan trips. This was predicted in March. Yes, the FS have gone up, but it's not because of demand. It is because of things like fuel prices going up. And then it was said, we were told, and these are the respectable media by the way, uh, summer will be the busiest travel season ever. Yes, it's very busy, but there are also things like flight cancellations, uh, bottlenecks with passports, uh, you know, staff shortages, uh, staff going on strike, and all these sort of uh, issues as well. So what's happening out there? It's not going to be as busy because you have a lot of very frustrated people. On the other hand, I want to share something about the interesting things that we media people get up to. Okay? So destinations hold, host what I, are called familiarization tours or fam trips, as we say for sure. <clears throat> this was one done, hosted by Sri Lanka in early February in, up to early March. What they did is they hosted media. I think there were about 15 uh, media who, who are travel influences okay so not the not the conventional journals technique all right so these are basically travel influences and bloggers who are going to go back and blast so they had a blast of a time of course there and um one that isn't known another fact really uh, that wasn't broadcast and uh, publicized as much is Sri Lanka had a whole series of them. So besides these, which were the uh, European and uh, American media, they had for South Korea, three from South Korea. And then they also had travel agents fan trips. And the interesting one to me, because of the irony of it all, is a trip that was in uh, late February. It was for 12 travel agents or tour operators from Ukraine and Russia, both together on the same trip. We all know that two weeks later, what happened? You could not put Ukraine and Russia together again. Okay, so I just wonder what happened to that campaign. And fast forward now to July, what's happened to poor Sri Lanka? All right. So the best of plans can go awry. And uh, don't blame COVID because people are not traveling for various reasons. And this is something I want to mention because I cover mice. Business events have not happened as fast or come back as fast as the leisure market. One exception is Singapore. Business events were allowed back but scaled up from 50 packs to 250 to 500 to 1,000 to 2,000 plus and now we're back to normal, okay? 
And this has been going on since October of 2020. The reason is Singapore is international. We don't have a, a sufficient domestic market to support. Okay, so this happens to be one of the exceptions. But when I show this, I also have to add something. Once we report about it uh, as editorial, there was a series uh, in the track, uh, the My Straight, what at least in one or two publications, which was sponsored content, meaning STB, the Singapore Tourism Board, did this in partnership with the media owner, okay, to put out this series. So you can ask about things like objectivity, but it, I must say it was very well produced, even if you say it's sponsored content. Thailand, on the other hand, is still banking on the amazing Thailand. Uh, and, and it was one of the first, by the way, to reopen with the Phuket sandbox and other things. So there we have it, you know, tourism picking up with easing of COVID curbs. And there are people all out in the streets again. Except what happens? Then you get another headline saying several popular destinations remain off limits to tourists. So then here again, it's the plus and minus, the demand and the supply. Because people can't go in, people can't get out, or if they do uh, make the trip, they face very long quarantines. And you think you know which countries are referring to. So finally, I just want to leave you with a few points to ponder. Think of people's media consumption patterns. Where do they get their information? How do they receive it? What do they like? Okay, And how do they then decide on their travel? Uh, just to mention, are we talking about allocentrics or psychocentrics? Is Flock's model even still valid today? I think he came up with it in 1974. It's almost 50 years. Okay, Are there mid-centrics that can be tapped? What are people's key concerns now? Is it still health? And safety, because the safety now also includes things like terrorism, not just COVID, all right? And cost in particular is becoming an issue. So TripAdvisor, I showed you the five countries just now in slide nine. They now did a follow-up of the summer in uh, of the same five countries. And what they found is very travel demand. So this was just in May for the season that we are in now, June to August. And what has happened is people are now more concerned about inflation, even whilst they want to travel, okay? They want to go into the big cities and beaches again, different from what was it was two years, uh, one or two years ago, okay? And they are making shorter trips, traveling closer to home. All these sort of studies, however, are not widely reported, unfortunately. And I would encourage those who are in the industry Okay, the tourism stakeholders go and look for these sort of uh, reports and studies, even if the media do not always uh, carry them, because even some of the trade media don't uh, publish this. Okay, uh, because it will help you try and figure out if you can how things will pan out. So this is a recap. I'm not going to go through this. Um, you can search for it online. It's something called the PESO model. P E S O. I have highlighted the different types, so I won't be explaining them. The paid media, the earned media, the shared media, which is basically your user-generated content uh, on social media, as well as uh, your partners, okay? because there's a lot of co-branding and alliances, etc. these days, so you cross-carry each other's uh, messages. And then, of course, the owned media which uh, are your own communication channels. So finally, I think I've overshot my time, but uh, I'll leave you with this. Uh, once I talked about PESO, do look at not just content. Content is very important, but don't forget the context in which it is presented. Underline trust again. My, my advice is be discerning. In whatever you read or, or watch uh, and hear, be discerning. Okay, digest before you click share. Okay, because it could be exaggerated, uh, either on the good or on the bad ones. Okay, so if we say the worst is over, what is your view? Do you see the blue skies as in this picture uh, and calm or clear seas ahead? 
Do you see green shoots sprouting and they are growing money, by the way? So for the ones where the marketers, uh, once the emotional image, uh, you know, kind of uh, the imagery was good, it is now time to use call to action if you want really to uh, get the business back. Okay, so I look forward to expanding on some of these points if you wish to uh, find out in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. Much appreciated. And you could please stop sharing and we'll go back to our panel. And we do have some questions in, but because I'm the host, I get to ask questions first. I'm very fortunate. So thanks so much for all of those um, thought provoking presentations, really, because they all intersect so nicely. And it did raise some questions for me. And my first question relates to the matter of risk, because we're talking about a real risk here. And I'm familiar in psychology with Sandman's approach, where he says that risk is a blend of hazard, the actual um, measurable hazard, and the outrage. It's the way that people perceive that hazard. And I think, Zora, you touched on this in a way that we need to go into crisis communication mode if the hazard is genuine. And I'm wondering then if tourism itself has a role to play here in this. Do, and we've seen in Geraldine's presentation, for instance, in the study that she cited where uh, media were playing that role in, determ in helping people understand safety uh, accurately. And also in her point five, I think in one of the final slides where she said that travel trends are related in some ways to the choices uh, people are basing them on safety. Sorry, I'm getting to my question here. Does tourism have a role to play in this now in promoting not just the destination itself, but how they're managing and mitigating the risks in their destinations? Uh, sorry, I had a little problem. Could you repeat your question? Uh, I know it was long-winded, Zora. I'm, I'm asking if you think that tourism as an industry has a role to play now, uh, not just through the media, not just relying on the media, but themselves actively playing a role in mitigating the, well, showing people how they're mitigating the risks, the actual hazard, um, in their destination. So not just the destination itself, but what they're doing to help the people who would come and visit. So what safety measures they've got in place, for instance. Yeah, exactly. That's a really good question. And this that is with the uh, focus on the same uh, topic as well, that tourism industry can play a big role to uh, influence the risk and the perception of the risk. And I think Jared mentioned in one of the slides that uh, how we can have kind of earned media or paid uh, media to focus on that. And it's not just on the government side to uh, do uh, some strategies of also tourism industry as well can uh, participate and play a role to uh, mitigate the risk and influence the perception uh, of the risk. Uh, I think, uh, again, in one of Jardine's images, which was shared, we could see how different uh, uh, sectors of tourism uh, were trying to influence the perception by giving this idea that we are offering uh, some services which are safe. And they were offering not service, but they were offering safety to the customers during COVID time. Thank you. So now I'm going to allow question and answers from the panel and we do have some, uh, the audience, and we do have some in our Q&A. So Professor Abhishek, our campus dean and one of your collaborators, uh, says, thank you, Rachel, Zora and Geraldine for your insights. How can DMOs such as Singapore Tourism Board use mass, mass slash social media to provide accurate information to build trust and to attract tourists? And I understand Geraldine would like to answer this question. Uh, yeah, if I may, um, Singapore Tourism Board actually has a very uh, well thought out strategy that they carry out. And they use different communication channels in different markets and different messages as well, because they do extensive market research. 
somewhat like Tourism Australia as well. Okay, where they really understand the audience and as I mentioned, media consumption habits and other things, they then pitch accordingly. STV's style used to be the good old conventional print ads and, and other things. Uh, they have moved away. In the last few years, you will find they do use a lot of influencer, uh, blogger kind of things through social media, through their those uh, people's respective websites and other uh, panels as well. Okay, so uh, it's not so much mass, although um, in the old days we used to say the internet was narrow versus mass media. I think it's the reverse. The, through the uh, internet, it is more mass than anything uh, we ever had in conventional media. So if you're talking about how they do it, um, I would say do look at the STD website. Very, very detailed, very good source of information. They don't hold back. So even something like the, the Tourism Industry Conference, which was held earlier this year, they posted the presentation. They posted the statistics. The whole world can see. Okay? And what are the different uh, methods uh, that they use in different markets. So very open to sharing. Thank you. So we have a question. I think this one's directed for Rachel. So Rachel, you talked about different types of media, such as social media, WhatsApp, for instance. Um, and Dr. Fu is one of our previous JCU staff members. So he's visiting us virtually from New Zealand, I believe, today. And he's saying gossiping is a part of human nature. And with today's media, which is done on social media, like WhatsApp, for example, so does that amount to, to mis- or disinformation, given that they're discussions of sorts? And then in a related question, uh, Professor Abhishek is asking, what steps can we take to ascertain authenticity mm. of news over WhatsApp and social media? That's right. And I think that goes to one of the points that I raised during the presentation as well, where we saw the image that was DW News, and it was a fake news image that had been circulated on social media as well as WhatsApp as well. I think to be safe, if it looks like it might be sensationalized, to go and have a check, look at the actual news source itself. You can go to the original news website just to confirm uh, what you're reading is factual, but also just uh, as Gerald Geraldine said, you know, look at things with, well, I mean, she didn't say this, but I mean, honestly, in the current environment, be a little bit more skeptical when something comes through on your phone via WhatsApp, especially given the current environment, um, go back and check official news sources to ensure that it is accurate before you share it. One of the key concerns that I had, um, one, as a former uh, PR director and media director in the public health uh, industry here in Singapore. So I used to work for within the public health um, industry here before coming back into into media. Is often news that shared via Twitter or or social media, where you know often, especially uh, so the social media generation, they may just look at a quick tweet. It's only a number of characters without clicking on the news link to understand. Um, the story behind it. And as Jared mentioned, with a lot of the alternative news set websites, they may have uh, perhaps clickbait headlines that uh, could uh, attract a certain type of reader without actually going in to look at the facts. So I think that's one thing. So again, going back to, to what I mentioned earlier, just, just check the source. Um, or have a look online, look at other news websites to see if the same story is being reported. That'll give you an indication of if it's factual, if it's on credible news sites as well, a number of credible news sites. Does that help? Does that answer the question? I think it did, but I'll let the others um, type in if they want to elaborate further. I have a question though that's related to that because I made notes while, while you were speaking as well. Um, and You've said that the media role has been useful for COVID-19 information, that people are, you know, getting trustworthy and reliable information that way. But on the other side of that, they are, now we're getting this new trend with fake travel sites, which is another worry. Mm. Um, but you've also shared that people have admitted that they've spread fake news themselves. So how can we how can we manage this this is really this is challenging 
It is. And I think that's the thing. It's, <laughs> I think there's a question from um, Mr. Fu or Mr. Kong as well that talks about, as you mentioned, gossiping. Mm -hmm. um, some people enjoy gossiping perhaps and sharing, you know, being the first to share something that may be sensationalized. So I think when you do receive a WhatsApp or a social media post that says, hey, look at this. Did you see the latest numbers? Go back and take a look at the MOH website or have a look on the Straits Times website to ensure that you know, perhaps we did get, we did have that number of COVID-19 cases yesterday, or, you know, what's the latest update on monkeypox here in Singapore? Um, I think one of the, the, the great things about covering COVID-19 over the last two years has been the rapid speed that we've seen updated information from the Ministry of Health here in Singapore in terms of um, just sharing information, daily numbers, uh, weekly press uh, briefings. So there was a constant information flow to ensure that factual information was going out. So I think, you know, fake news, fake websites, they are concerning. And I think if you are concerned about telling the difference between fact or fake, just go back to a credible source to be sure. Thank you. And I'd like to just go back to something. Oh, sorry, it's all right. Uh, just getting connected to what Abhishek asked earlier and Jordan was uh, responding and the question uh, is just answered by Rachel. Uh, I want to say that uh, what I experienced uh, in Singapore during this time, it was that it was not easy just to go to uh, government websites and check the numbers uh, or get updates. But uh, what was interesting to me that uh, Singapore did um, having a, a Instagram and Telegram channel, which uh, easily uh, those important news was uh, uh, kind of, uh, I was exposed to them every day when I joined the channel. So instead of for WhatsApp messages or messages from other people, uh, it was accessible for me to have uh, firsthand uh, updates, which I could trust. And I think that was a smart from Singapore to do that, and it, it could avoid uh, uh, such mistakes. And uh, Jardine mentioned that websites can have vast information, but it's kind of passive way because we do not search those websites every day, but always and every day we check our WhatsApp or Telegram. So I think there are some smart ways to uh, target uh, Kind of new generation or uh, those who are those who are more into uh, these new ways of communication just could i just add on to that because we have seen a an evolution in terms of media communication from media platforms such as print publications and radio stations so during the pandemic we if there's an update we'll often reach out to our listeners via social media as well if it's a big breaking news update. And we did see during the pandemic, Straits Times started, a, well, they, they have a daily online Facebook update. Um, the big story, which is broadcast every day over social media at 5 p.m., that gives an update on the breaking stories of the day. So that's another way that a credible news source is reaching into social media to provide factual information. That's so interesting. Maybe we need to find our own... Um travel site telegram feeds to get uh, genuine feeds into there. I'm, I'm pretty sure the hackers would find a way to get into them. I'm very pessimistic in that sense. <laughs> but yeah, that's really interesting that um, the social media people find ways to find trustworthy um, news through them as well. So they, they're positive as well. Um, I'd just like to go back to a question that has been answered. Uh, Geraldine, thank you for typing in your response to Prof um, Kwong from who's visiting us from Vietnam. So he asked, what supportive policy that the government in your country applied to limit fake news on the tourism services? And I'm just opening up that, to that in case Zore or Rachel would also like to um, respond. Supportive policies that governments have applied to limit fake news on tourism services. Well, I think from Singapore's perspective, Geraldine's already answered on uh, POFMA, mm. which is the big one here. Yeah. It's all right from your perspective, given that you, you're traveling and you're in a different country at the moment. <laughs> how is it internationally, do you think? Uh, actually, uh, 
I think Geraldine and Rachel are more aware of that side of the, and that kind of policies. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I have nothing to add here. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I can just add, sorry, uh, Denise. Please go ahead. Uh, not so much about POFMA, but about fact-checking in general. Um, for the bigger media organizations, there is actually a team that helps. So once a journalist is uh, responsible for getting the facts right uh, and checking the sources and other things, they also, for the bigger um, outfits, they have a team that helps with fact-checking. Uh, it's, um, you know, freelancers like me that are really challenged because we have to do a lot of research. And when I'm doing subbing, uh, what is called a sub-editor, really for the uh, both the trade as well as consumer media, the sub-editor is also responsible for fact-checking. So mm -hmm. it is, you know, um, there are two layers, the writer as well as the sub-editor. And that's why sometimes you will find correction. You know, um, the the proper thing to do is to correct if if you were, if it was a uh, misreporting. Mm -hmm. But of course, if the entire if the whole intention was misrepresentation, that's a whole different ball game. Okay, but I may also mention here that uh, associations play a part. So, for instance, the Asian American Journalists Association ran a series of workshops, of, uh, I think there were two Saturdays or three Saturdays, where they told us how to do fact-checking because there are a lot of freelancers and others like, uh, you know, who are not, uh, who don't have access to the huge uh, machinery that comes with uh, big media outfits. Mm -hmm. so, so associations are also doing their part. Okay, thank you. And I'm also going back to some of the questions that have been answered by our speakers in the in text, but this one's an interesting one. If a journalist finds a virus outbreak in an area before it's reported officially by the government, would he or she forewarn the public on this or wait for official approval of information release, which may be a risk to the public? And thank you, Rachel, for responding. I'm just wondering if anyone would like to elaborate on that. Yeah, so I think in my in my response um, for those that you may have not that may have not seen my response to this question, I've just asked. I think the key question is here, as we mentioned, the importance of the credibility of sources. Who is the source, and um, can it be verified? As Geraldine mentioned, it's critical um, to ensure that a, a source is is credible, verifiable, and. As journalists, we go through multiple steps to ensure that a source is factual. And I think it come back in some ways to the um, trust in the government that they would report an outbreak if one existed, like if they really knew about it. So I hope it would be unlikely for a journalist to find one before the government would um, announce if an outbreak was in place. Yeah, I think this is a very hypothetical question. Yeah. <laughs> Can I jump in again? Yes, please. Uh, just to mention, uh, there is something called a news embargo. So um, reporters may receive in advance, but there may be a certain time because there's going to be a press conference at which a uh, new policy or new case numbers or something may be announced. So uh, we are expected to, uh, you know, maintain this principle. And I think recently, um, one of the other media uh, outlets in Singapore, which it actually does very well, it's, it's very highly ranked uh, and is able to challenge uh, CNA as well as uh, SD, uh, which are leading uh, media outlets uh, in surveys. They had their uh, media access limited for one or two months because they wrote news uh, before the official time. Oh, so there, there, are ways, there are ways that it's done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's enlightening. Uh, now I'm going back to the open questions. So Nimrod here is one of our uh, Learning Centre advisors and he's uh, thanking speakers for sharing ideas. Quick question, what's your thought about sadism and its link to fake news spreading antagonism and hate? What can media do in case sadism is linked to fake news or hate speech? 
So this is getting away from the tourism component a little bit. It's more about the social media and the virality of it, I think. <laughs> Do, does, is the media itself its own gatekeeper? Like, can can high pressure media outlets enforce any kind of uh, pressure on media that they don't want to be um, promulgated? Okay, so from my perspective, because I'm a business journalist, this is something that's a little bit out of the box uh, for me. Yeah, it, it's yeah, I agree. It's a kind of a, a tough one, and I think a lot of the the social media sites now are trying in some ways to be gatekeepers and block people when they're doing these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do have the the governmental controls coming in as well, so we'll leave that one open. Uh, we have an anonymous question here: What's your views on international media competition to promoting their respective destinations? So emerging destinations often lose out on the types of competition because they don't have the wherewithal in the public domain space to compete with the more well-financed destinations. Zora, any views on that one? Uh, if I got the question correctly, because I do not have it here to have a look, but uh, I think maybe uh, emerging destinations uh, can get use of uh, farm trips and what is so uh, famous these days using influencers. So I think that can be an option or strategy to mm -hmm. start with. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I, I confirm that's what uh, is being done. A lot of destinations are doing that. They also take part in trade shows. So they will take a national pavilion, for instance, in a travel and tourism show. Uh, some of these shows even allow maybe the last one or two days open to public. So initially it's trade and then it goes uh, open to public. So it's a lot cheaper if you have uh, your NTO or your DMO that is uh, proactive enough, takes a, takes a bigger booth than all the children clamber on board at a much cheaper cost because on their own, they can't afford. And special rates apply, by the way, to um, some of the emerging markets, the less uh, well-off ones. And you have others like PATA, Pacific Asia Travel Association, who do a lot. So even during the pandemic, they had virtual trade shows and other things, and the cost was not very, very high. Mm -hmm. So, so um, it needs... Uh, planning and uh, savvy marketing, which unfortunately, um, not all, as, as the, the question was phrased, not all have the wherewithal, but there are some resources that are available uh, that don't cost all that much. My, my only comment is uh, in terms of fam trips, um, there are things that uh, some people don't know, like who gets to go on the trip, are they really the ones you want? Okay, um, so, so there are various issues involved. Thank you. Uh, I, I can share more insights, perhaps, uh, if the JCU, uh, Singapore um, Press Club wants, wants to have a session, I'm happy to do a workshop on the ins and outs. <laughs> Thanks for your kind offer. Today, we're out of time for our session. So time went like in a blink of an eye almost. Uh, I'm really pleased to have heard all of your views though. And thank you for the audience, the audience for the questions. Uh, Dr. Fu saying lovely forum and discussions. And he's off for the night. Uh, please do fill out the, the uh, survey and the poll, your satisfaction poll before we leave. And uh, I thank you all for coming and to our wonderful speakers. It was very insightful. And I'm thinking about whether I'm courageous, all right? I don't know if I've stepped up into that um, courageous group yet in tourism. <laughs> I haven't planned any trips myself this year yet. But uh, I hope everyone will com complete the poll and otherwise um, you're welcome to exit the seminar. Uh, if speakers would like to just stay back for a moment, we can regroup and have a powwow. <laughs> but thanks everyone for coming, bye-bye. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye.